And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. They forsook all and followed him. I want to preach this today, this Sunday, on a service, a message, a sermon that I've been thinking about and praying about and studying for a period of time on why few believers are true followers. Only a few of real genuine believers will ever turn out to be true followers of Jesus Christ. The word follower means a devoted person to a particular person, cause, or activity. It's referring to one that is willing to be mobile or motivated to move behind someone or something. This is where we get our word disciple. The word disciple means that you are a follower of Christ. You can be saved and not be a disciple. You can be saved and not be a follower. But before you can be classified as a true follower of Jesus in verse number 11, you must first experience verse number 1 through verse number 10. It's these verses that test and reveals the reason why so few of God's people are really being turned into true followers of Jesus Christ. If I were to ask you today, not if you're saved, but what if I were to ask you, are you a follower of Jesus? Are you closely behind the shadows of the Nazarene? Can Jesus depend on you? Or are you just saved enough not to go to hell when you die and just miserable enough not to go all the way with God? Let me show you what the Bible says our will must be willing to do before we are ever classified a follower of Jesus. First of all, in verse number one and verse number two, you've got to be willing to distance yourself from certain people. You remember when Jesus got on Simon Peter's ship in verse number one and verse number two, he told him the reason why he needed to get in the boat is there was so many hundreds and maybe even thousands of people that were gathered around the seashore and it was lined with people. Simon Peter had been there his whole life. All those people that were on the shore, those were his family. Those were his distant relatives. Those were his friends. Those were people that he grew up with. But Jesus turned and looked at him and said, Look, if you want to be a real follower of me and you're serious about this, I want you to kind of launch out a little bit away from them. You see, you, you can't be a, a follower of Jesus unless you're willing to distance yourself from some people that will hinder you from going all the way with God. There are certain relationships in our life that if we're not careful, it'll keep us from ever launching out in the deep and being what all Jesus wants us to be. Now, now Jesus is in the boat. It's a type of being saved. He's already in the vessel. When you get saved, you get Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus is already in the vessel. But he looked at Peter and said, if you're going to follow me, you see all that family? You see all those friends? You see all your high school buddies? You see all the crowd you work with? You see the crowd you used to run with? You see the crowd you went to the bars with? You see the crowd you laid out with? You see the crowd you slept with? Get away from them. Get away from them. The night I got saved, before I ever got off the altar on my knees, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, you will never be what I want you to be until you change your hitching post. I had to get away from negative influences and people that would do nothing but hinder me from launching out in the deep and being what God wants me to be. Now, I want to make a statement. Now, you listen to me very carefully. Any relationship that comes in your life that takes you away from following Jesus is not of God. I don't care who it is. I don't care what it is. Any relationship that drives you away from God controlling you and you following him, it is not of God. There are some times when you may have to get away from certain family, and I'm sorry it's that way. There may be some times you need to tell some friends, the next time I see you, it'll be at church because I'm not coming here anymore. I got saved. I've changed hitching posts. I want to be all God wants me to be, and in order to do so, I've got to get away from a negative influence. Am I preaching this morning? You've got to be willing to distance yourself from certain people. No doubt when Peter looked out across that bank of the shore of that land, 
No doubt he saw his cousins and his, maybe even his grandparents. I know he was married because he had a mother-in-law and Jesus raised her from the bed of affliction. So I'm sure he was glad to get on the boat to get away from her. But, but there were relationships. He'd grown up with these kids and they played in the backyard and, and they'd done a lot of things together. And I tell you, it's not an easy thing, but it's a right thing. There are some people that I love and I've enjoyed in my life, but I had to put distance between me and them because I'm not going in the same direction that they're going anymore. They're standing on the shore, but I want to get out in the deep and I want to be everything God wants me to be. So I've got to leave them behind. You've got to put distance between yourself and those that would hinder you from following the Lord. Number two, you've got to be willing not only to put distance, but you've got to be willing to be disturbed. Following Jesus disturbs lifestyle. Verse 3 and 4, here's what happened. Peter, James, and John had fished all night. They didn't even catch a minnow. Nothing. So after fishing all night, they come back to the shore, they set their boats up, and now they're washing their nets. Do you know how tired and frustrated they must have been? You got to understand, Brother Doug, when they're fishing, they're out on the bow of that boat and they got these big heavy nets and they are throwing them and dragging them all night long. These men are tired. They're exhausted. They want to go home. They want to eat and go to bed. And they're washing their nets. I looked it up. It was so important. They had to wash their nets. It was thin strings that were knitted together so that when they threw it in the water, the water would easily pass through. If they did not clean their nets when they come out of the water, they would stink and the rats would come and chew holes in their nets and thereby they would lose their product. They would also, the nets would get heavy with the, with the bacteria that was on it. When they would throw it in the water, the fish would hear it and they would run. So they're up all night long. They've caught absolutely nothing and they're frustrated and they're in the middle of cleaning their nets and they want to go home. And Jesus said, hey, can I borrow your boat? Borrow my boat? I have been up all night long. I have not caught a minnow. We, Peter used the word toil. That means to labor fervently. He said, I have labored all night long. I'm exhausted. I want to go home and go to bed and wish for a better tomorrow. And Jesus said, if you're going to be a follower of me, you've got to be willing to let me disturb your life. It's not convenient to follow Jesus. If you're waiting on everything to fall in place to follow the Lord, you might as well forget it. You will never get in line, and you will never be a disciple. It will always be a sacrifice. It will always be a disturbance. It will always be uncomfortable to the flesh. Nowhere in the Bible did Peter say, Woo! I fished all night washing my nets all day, and now I get to go back out in the burning hot sun with this Jew that wants to scream at everybody. But in order to be what God wants you to be, are you willing to be disturbed? You say, oh, i got my life planned out. Not if you're going to be a follower, you don't. He can disturb your life. The last thing I was interested in was being a preacher. I wanted to be an embalmer. I wanted to bury dead people. You never have to argue with them. You're the last one to let them down, and they never talk back to you. No, instead, God puts me in this ministry thing. I don't even like people. I don't even have a personality. I don't know why any of you are here today. I don't even know if I'd be here if I wasn't the pastor of the church. I don't know why anybody would want to hear me. And God destroyed my plans and my future and my security and put me into something that I didn't feel then or now that I'm equipped to do. But I knew if I was going to follow Jesus, Jesus. I was going to have to take the hands off the plow and say, not my will, but thine be done. And whatever God wants me to do, that's what I'll be willing to do. Are you willing to let God disturb your life? You've got to be willing to be disturbed. Number three, you've got to be willing to be directed. In verse number four and five, Jesus gave Peter two commands. One was to thrust out from the land and the other was to launch out in the deep. Now here's why I know in the generation coming, Brother Collins, we are going to have problems with this younger generation being disciples. I'm going to tell you, Brother Mark, you listen to me well. 30 years from now, the average church is going to be a disaster. Because in order to be a disciple, you got to be willing to obey what Jesus says. Now here's why it's going to be a problem. We've got a generation... That doesn't obey anything anybody says. 
They tell their parents no. They tell them to shut up. They tell them I'll do it if I want to. They'll tell them do it yourself if you don't like it. Now I'll tell you something, brother. You wouldn't have lasted around my house five seconds. My daddy would have fired your rear end up till the smoke alarm went off. That's what my daddy would have done. My daddy told me to do something one time, and when he did, he never had to go back and check. Brother McCarty to see if it was done. He knew it was done if he told me to do it because he was teaching me to obey the voice of authority. Now, you parents, you're listening to me. You're raising heathens because you will not make them listen to the voice of authority. They talk back to their principal. They talk back to their teachers. I was watching a video that a policeman sent me yesterday. I never heard such filthy language coming out of a man's mouth, standing nose to nose with a policeman, calling him everything but a human being. And that policeman had to stand there and take that while that boy talked vile and wicked and ungodly in the face of that policeman for doing his job. It went on for seven non-stop minutes. That boy was ranting and raving and screaming. You know what his problem? is he's never been taught to obey the voice of authority amen that's right you mark it down most of these people that have problems with policemen doing their jobs they're nothing but a bunch of spoiled brats that got everything they ever wanted and mom and dad never said no and they never beat the devil out of them and so when they don't listen when their parents speak they don't listen when the principal speaks they don't listen when the police speak and they're not going to listen when God speaks and we are going to fill our churches with a generation of kids that want to drop in, do their 30-minute thing, drop out, and forget about it till next Sunday. You know why these buildings are here? You know why this massive auditorium's paid for? You know why all this land is paid for? You know why our parking lots are paid for? You know why the remodeling is all paid for? Because somebody got serious about following Jesus. And you better tighten up and get serious about it yourself. You've got to take directions from God. Both times, though Peter didn't understand it, he obeyed him. And because of that, he was blessed, surmountedly speaking. Would you be willing to let God disturb you and direct you and change your plans and dreams and send you in another direction? Oh, God have mercy on us. When David Livingston was converted, the great missionary to Africa, David Livingston so loved God and so loved the mission field that when David Livingston died in Africa, they found him dead beside his bed on his knees. When they found David Livingston dead, the village turned him over and cut open his chest and took his heart out and sent his body back to England. They said his body may belong to England, but his heart belongs to Africa. And David Livingston counted everything but loss and went to Africa and stayed there until he died. You know why that happened? Because of, it was because of a commitment he made when he was 16. At the age of 16, David Livingston wrote down a prayer he gave to God. He said, number one, send me anywhere. Only promise me you'll go with me. 16-year-old boy. Number two, put anything on me. Only promise me you'll sustain me. Number three, send me anywhere and break every tie that binds me, except the tie that binds me to thee. He was a legend in his 50s because he decided to let God direct his life when he was a 16-year-old boy. Oh, what a difference we could make at Emmaus Baptist Church if we could get a handful of young people that would just quit worrying about being entertained and having pizza and skating parties and get a boy or a girl that would stand up and say, you know what, I just want to give it all to Jesus. I just want to be a follower. You've got to be willing to let God direct you. Verse number 6 through verse number 7, you've got to be willing to be a distributor. Now let me tell you something business-wise. I've been in the business world many years, and God has blessed me. If I'm out, of boat, I'm out on a boat with Jesus, and I'm the only one that responded to him, and my boat's overflowing with fish, I'm going to call someplace and get a rental boat, and I'm going to have them bring me a couple of rental boats, and I'm going to pack up three or four boats, and I'm going to benefit from this. 
I want all the benefits. I put in all the labor. I'm the only one that listened. Everybody else back on shore, they didn't want to do what Jesus. I'm the only one that was willing to be disturbed and be directed by God. And now all these fish are coming in and his boat begins to sink. And here's what he does next. James! John! Bring your boat and get out here! You know what he's wanting to do? He's wanting to share his experience with somebody else. You want to be a follower of Jesus when God begins to bless you, when God saves you, when God does miracles for you? You shouldn't try to captivate it all yourself. It's more than you can handle. It'll take you under. But what you need to do is call back to the show, the son that hadn't launched out yet, and said, Hey, John, it's worth every mile. Hey, James, it's worth every trial. Get your boat. Come on in. The water's fine. You know why people don't want what we have? Because they don't, they don't see anything overwhelming us. Peter was overwhelmed with what God was doing for him and in his life. And he wanted to share it with everybody. Could it be the reason why you don't ever share Jesus with anybody? Is you're not overwhelmed by him. Has Jesus ever done something special for you? Has the Lord ever done anything supernatural for you he saved my soul supplied my every need puts clothes on my back shoes on my feet roof on my head food in my refrigerator gas in my car a bible in my hand the holy ghost in my heart you better believe i get overwhelmed and when i do i want to pass it on to somebody else you'll just want to pass it on to somebody else you've got to be willing to distribute what god's done for you number five and this one's rough you got to be willing to be dis decreased. you got to be decreased. Verse 8 and 9, Peter falls down at the knees of Jesus, and he said, I'm a sinner. You know, if I were to ask you how many of you were sinners, I I'm sure every hand would go up here. And if yours didn't, I'm sure your wife would raise both for hers on your account. Now, you got to remember this, Brother Charles. Peter is on a ship with Jesus, right? They're coming back in. The thing's laden with fish. It's overflowing with fish. You remember the family I talked about being on the shore in verse 1 and 2? They're still standing there, Brother Glenn, watching all this. And in front of all of his family, and in front of all of his friends, and in front of all of his buddies, Peter gets down on his knees and said, I'm a sinner. It's one thing for you to say it to God, but would you ever be humble enough to say it in front of your family? And your friends. Humility is something that must happen in our life if God is going to get a fulfillment out of us. We've got to be willing to say, you know what, I really don't care what they say. I don't care what they think. I know one thing. I'm not right. I remember when I got saved. We were sitting there and the preacher was starting to preach. I looked across the auditorium. I don't know why or how they were there, but there were several boys that I'd fought. And days gone by. One boy that I'd wrestled in high school was sitting there. They all knew I was a fighter, raised on the streets, mean and crazy. And there they all sat with some girls in the church that night. Sitting over on the other side was some of the football players from the high school that I was in. And they all knew me and I knew them. And I was sitting there while that man was preaching on hell and giving the revelation of dying without God. And let me tell you, let me tell you how sorry the devil is. While God was dealing with me, the devil said, what's that fellow over there going to think? Hey, what, what do you think the football team's going to say when they get out of this church and they see you go down to that aisle and say, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. And by the way, you knocked that boy over there out in the second round. He thinks you're the meanest thing on the block. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when he turns around and sees you standing down there telling everybody you're a sinner? And right in the middle of that message, I said to myself, Brother Collins, come hell or high water. I ain't a for a football team, and I'm not going to hell over a boxing opponent. I tell you what, I'm a sinner! And let me tell you something, girl, before the devil, before I'd ever let the devil take me out of it, you know what I did? Right in the middle of his message, I jumped up. I said, I ain't waiting any longer. The low-down devil ain't talking me out of this. I'm getting to God. And I ran down in front of 300 people. I stood in front of 300 people and said, I'm a sinner. I'm going to hell. And I need God. And I've been doing that for 42 years. I've never been sorry that I got out of my seat that day and made Jesus...
the Lord of my life. You've got to be decreased. You've got to be humble. You've got to come down to nothing. Number six, this is where I want to get verse 10 and 11. You've got to be willing to decide. In verse 11, the Bible said they forsook all. Do you see that? When they got back to shore, I shared this with the men out on the prayer ride and bike ride this week. Here's Peter working hard to make a living. He's trying to pay his bills, keep his house rent up, keep his wife in a nice car. And all of a sudden, brother, he's got more fish in his boat than he's made in a year. Now, Brother McCarter, you talking about set? He's financially taken care of now, Ron. He can go home now and retire. We have rich people here like that, Brother Glenn, several other people just around. They're so rich, they count money. It takes them till noon, count their money every day. He was fit for life. What he'd worked hard for all of his life, God gave it to him in one night. But God was trying to just check and see how dedicated he was. Peter could have pulled that boat up and said, I'm sold fish, I'm retired, I'm set for life. Man, this is good stuff. But the very thing he'd been looking for his whole life, he turned around and left it and followed Jesus. The word follow means to abandon. It means to desert. It means to leave. It means to cast aside. It means to break off in a way that it cannot be fixed. It says he forsook all. The word all means the whole, everything, all together, or it's in its entirety. Here's, what it, here's the implication it gives. When it says they forsook all and followed him, here's the implication it gives. It gives the implication of holding a shovel in front of a bunch of trash and pushing the trash on that shovel with a broom and taking that shovel outside to a garbage can and throwing it all in there. That's the implication of forsaking all. Considering that nothing but trash, scooping it up and getting it out of your life forever. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I count all things as dung. I count all things as lost. Outside of following Jesus, nothing else is important to my life. Oh, what a difference we could make in our generation, folks. If I could get you to wake up and once and for all get serious about being dedicated. Listen, the Bible didn't say, people shall know you're my children because you love one another. It didn't say that. You shall know you are my disciples because you love one another. You got to be a follower of Jesus. How serious are you about this? And by the way, parents, quit coming to me trying to get your kids serious about something that you're not even serious about yourself. Don't expect your kids to be on the mission field when you don't have any dedication in your own life. It's not my responsibility to get your kids dedicated. It's not, it's got to be more than my influence that'll get them dedicated. You parents need to step up to the plate and say, I'm going all the way with God. I want you to see me go all the way with God. And I want you to go all the way with God. Now, some of you are not going to do it. You are happy where you're at. You're saved just enough to have Jesus in the boat. I still want to be your pastor and love you. But let me tell you what will happen to you, and I'm done. Number one, you'll start finding fault with everybody else. Everywhere in the Bible where you find people that didn't want to go all the way with God, the first thing they start doing was justifying not being what they should be by pointing their finger and saying, yeah, but what about him? You know what she said? You know what that fellow over there is doing? You start pointing at everybody else to justify the fact that you're not going all the way. I, I know I'm preaching this morning, so, you know, I don't need you to clap. I'd appreciate it, but I don't need it. You, you start finding fault with everybody else. That's a sign that you're not a follower of Jesus. Because when you're following Jesus, your eyes are on him, and what everybody else does doesn't even get in your vision because you're too busy watching him. You start finding fault with everybody else. Number two, you fizz out. Eventually, you quit being something you're not. I uh, think we've raised a generation of Alka-Seltzer Christians. Boy, when you first get them in the, in the cup, they're fizzing and a-bubbling and a-flipping and a-turning, and you think, wow, this thing's going to overflow the cup. Just hold on a few minutes. It ain't long to they're dissolved, they're gone. It's back down to nothing. It's just a little bit of scum and film on top of the water. That's the kind of Christianity we're having. 
People come in, they look so fired up. Oh boy, I can't wait to get here. This is the best church I've ever been in. I never felt the Spirit of God like this before in my life. Whoa, I gotta be a part of this church. I've had them join and never come back. I don't even know where they're at. They, they couldn't wait to join. I'm afraid to open the doors of the church anymore because it seems like you love God more before you join than you do after you join. Oh yeah, I'm preaching. And you fizz out and it's everybody else's fault. And then you forsake your rewards. You don't know what you're missing by not going all the way with Jesus. I got news for you. Don't feel sorry for me. This is the best life I've ever lived. And if I had it to do all over again, I'd give my life to Jesus. Let's give the Lord a hand. You're glad to be here today? Romeo, do you know that song, I've Decided to Follow Jesus? Would you play that song?